this week's portion is Vayera. It comes from Shemot, which is Exodus, the sixth chapter. Chapter six uh, is the beginning with verse two, or you could go to verse one, I guess, if you wanted to. We have entered into the great saga of the Israel, uh, Israel's redemption. We're going to see a, a bit of interplay between the Israelites, Moshe and Aaron, in which uh, Moshe, Moshe is filled with some level of self-doubt, uh, like almost like telling God, I told you so, <laughs> right? I told you they wouldn't believe me. Um, you hear uh, some dialogue go back and forth with Moshe and Hashem that sounds at, at some level like, um, like God bringing some correction to Moshe, but I think that that may be a bit over overdone. I think to see it in the light of what it really means, we'll get a better understanding. This, this portion, and we have a lot to cover, obviously, because Rosh Hashem, you guys allowed me time off to go visit my mom, and she's doing well. And, um, you know, uh, we've had all this time, extra time during the holidays, so while everybody was doing their thing, um, you guys had plenty of time to study Torah this week, and so this should be an exciting class. So. Uh, the, the Lord spoke to Moshe and said to him, I am the Lord, verse 2 of Shemot chapter 6. I revealed myself to Abraham and to Isaac and to Yaakov as El Shaddai, but I did not make myself known to them by my name, Lord. And we know that when you see the Lord there, it is the sacred name of Hashem, correct? Mm -hmm. It is the Yud, as Rabbi Greenbaum, I think, says, Yud He Vav He, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it um, so we understand that it is the great revelation of the sacred name of God here. Where does that come from? He says, Yet I have established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, or Canaan, the land of their sojourning in which they sojourn. Yea, the Israelites' complaining was heard before me that the Egyptians are holding them in bondage. My covenant was remembered. Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will deliver you from your oppressor, oppressive Egyptian work. I will deliver you from their work. If you'll notice in, in my translation or from Onkelos, Onkelos treats the, the whole text dealing with the Israelite people very differently than what you'll find in your Chumash. And the the uh, Targumists uh, are when they when they go through and they sort of tra they translate from the Hebrew and they begin to uh, describe what is going on. Oftentimes, Onkelos feels that he must be very careful not to do anything or say anything that makes the Israelites look bad, looks negative. Now, there is a, this is a very positive attribute in a mitzvah, to not speak against your fellow, correct? To always say positive, uplifting things. Even if you have to say a negative thing, you find out a way to say it in the most positive light. You know, if you've heard the old <coughs> phrase, someone says, I mean this. Let's see, how's it go? In the best way possible. In the best yeah. way possible. <laughs> and you know, boy, you better, you better hold on because it's coming, right? Yes. I mean this in the best possible way. Or don't take offense to this. Right. Right? Please don't be offended. But, I mean, you just know you're getting ready to get unloaded on. But Onkelos does an amazing job. When you hear phrases, for example, and he drove them out of Egypt, that he says, and... and Paro uh, allowed them to uh, go down from Egypt, right? It's a big difference in language. It's almost a difference between driving them out like wild animals or allowing them to leave with their dignity and humanity, which is a pretty powerful thing. And I really do believe that whenever we read the text, it's, 
uh, very important for us to not assume the most negative. Don't assume the most negative. I don't know what it is, but we're just, maybe it's our human nature. We hear an interaction between God and man and we just automatically assume the most negative. It almost sounds like, say again. No, I was going to say that's the way, well, from my experience, that's the way it's been taught. Well, absolutely. I think that that's the case. If, you, if you've been raised in a particular religious view, that would be the case. Uh, now, this comes on the heels of uh, Moshe seemingly being doubtful, right? Because he says, look, you, the children didn't hear me. You know, the Israelites didn't hear me. How is Pharaoh going to hear me now? Uh, what's your name? You know, this whole idea that Moshe is the only one. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob never asked Hashem what his name was. Who are you? Yeah, who are you? Right? It's like um, they just assumed it didn't matter what his name was. But the, what appears to be the correction here was not so much that Moshe asked him his name. <clears throat> Moshe needed to understand what Hashem was going to do in his life. He also knew that if I'm going to speak on behalf of the creator of the universe, would it not be good to have some type of attribute attached to who this creator is? It wasn't about a name. It was about describing the enormous attributes of Hashem to the Egyptian people. The Egyptian people had gods for everything. They had the god of the Nile, right? Mm -hmm. They had the god of the, the sun. They had the, wow. the frog gods, mm -hmm. right? They had gods for everything. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is that these are, were the attributes of that particular deity. A frog, for example, carried about in its uh, instinctive animal life attributes that this particular deity had. And so that's why they would address it by this particular way. And so it was important for Moshe to know, well, if I'm going to come and say, I come to you in the invisible creator of the universe who's never revealed himself to man uh, through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they go, who is that? Right? And then he's concerned, it, you know, Pharaoh's not going to listen to me. The people aren't going to listen to me. I'm just in a fix. So he says, I revealed myself to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Yaakov as El Shaddai. Why the differentiation between El Shaddai and yud chei vav -Hei? Why the difference? Why now yud chei vav -Hei? Because it describes him, doesn't it? It absolutely describes him. It absolutely describes him. Why does El Shaddai subscribe, describe God in this way? It's not, I think I've heard some you know, people say, incorrectly, but they've said this, that uh, Moshe had not appreciated Hashem in his ability to supply. And so he never saw the El Shaddai part of God, and he needed to see this other part. And th that's not the whole it the issue. The difference between El Shaddai, which describes Hashem's action with Yaakov, uh, Abraham, and Yitzhak, but I also think that uh, the people needed to know what's in it for me. P precisely, mm -hmm. precisely. Yeah. So absolutely, and, and, and that's, that's actually the next level. Let's first go back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The idea that they knew him as El Shaddai meant that the attribute they experienced when they came in contact with the creator of the universe was the attribute of the miraculous through natural means. Is that, you follow? Uh, here, here would be an example. Um, I'm on a long trip, a breakdown in my car. Uh, it's two o'clock in the morning. There's no traffic on this long country road. And lo and behold, a record driver pulls up. Right? <laughs> right? And you would say, Brooke Hashem, this is great, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's like uh, God supplies. He took care of that. But it's not like this angelic being came down and, you know, fixed my car and flew off. You know, there's a big difference between the two. El Shaddai is sort of the natural supply that God gives us. And we've all, we all experience the El Shaddai mm -hmm. of Hashem. Right. Is it divine, divine providence? Divine. <coughs> uh, divine providence, yeah. It's, it's the ample supply of everything that you could need 
be, and you recognize that it's the hand of God. That's why our daily prayers are so important. That is why that every time that you receive in your being a food, you bless Hashem for the food. Every time that you see something that is joyful or you experience something in your life that you realize that this is the supply, that this is the El Shaddai of Hashem, then it's, that's why you bless Him. Because you are acknowledging the same level of relationship with Hashem that the great patriarchs had. Yes. Now Moshe needed something more. Why? Because the people. The people. Yep. The people needed to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Hashem was working on their behalf. Mm -hmm. We've heard stories of the uh, m miraculous things that took place in the Six Day War, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what was the name of the TV series that came out? It was called... Impossible? No. Something, impo yes. something impossible. Oh, yeah. um, Not Mission Impossible. No. no. <laughs> Against all odds. Against all odds. Great, great video, right? Uh, the difference between El Shaddai and Yud Chevavche is El Shaddai is how the soldiers were able to maintain their courage and strength in the most difficult of situation and maintain an extreme fighting posture in the in the worst of all odds, right? That's El Shaddai. But the Yuche Vavhe, the all self sustaining one, the one who brings down the miraculous to the physical world is a story that I hear of when the Temple Mount was being assaulted. And you guys probably remember this, but the Temple Mount's being assaulted and the, uh, some of the Israeli soldiers are at a higher level and as they're coming up, they realize that there are Arabs at one level above them and they realize the Arabs are trying to get to root them out of the Temple Mount. So they begin to exchange fire and they get down to the last, literally the last handful of rounds and they they all look at each other, they take assessment of their, how many rounds they have, and it's like, this is it. It's over with, okay? So we're all going to fight until we're the last man. And so they begin to return this volley of last few rounds, and all of a sudden, uh, one of the Arab fighters stood up and pointed over their head and started screaming, Abraham, Abraham, the name, you know, Abraham. They, they saw a vision of Abraham. And it scared them so bad, they, they threw their weapons down and ran away from the temple. How can you explain that? And then they interviewed one of the guys who was in that, who said, yes, this is what happened. And it's an, that is the miraculous, that's, you can't explain that. What Israel needed is they needed to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Hashem was getting ready to do what He's going to do. When we think of our own redemption... And the days before the final redemption. Uh, you know, we, we have naysayers and people that say that the end of the world's coming and you know, everything's going to go to hell in the handbasket. And it could, it could. Okay, you could happen, right? It could happen. But we don't really know what's going to happen. In spite of what may happen, one thing for sure. Prophets are clear that all doubt will be removed when redemption comes. Mm -hmm. All doubt will be removed. As a matter of fact, we know that it will be so amazing that all people will bow and declare the creator of the universe as Yulchei Bavre. You will no longer call them just Lord by another name or God. Mm -hmm. But all, even the idols will bow down according to the Midrash. Buddha will finally get, Buddha will finally get up and declare <laughs> Hashem is creator of the universe. I mean, think, I, you know, now what that means, who knows what it means, but everybody, the light's going to come on it's for everyone. Mm -hmm. The reason why that it's, the, the, the reason why right now that we battle with such great fervor to bring the knowledge of God to the world is the same reason that Moshe had to deal with the same, with the same issue. When Moshe goes to Israel, what happened when he came and told, to, told Paro, let my people go, right? What happened? You mean Egypt. You said Israel. 
No, when he went to Paro, when he yeah, went to Pharaoh. In Egypt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in Egypt. But what did he do to, when he asked that? What, what did the Egyptians do to Israel? They made their work they harder. Yes. Yes. They made it harder. Mm -hmm. The closer that we get to redemption, and the closer that we get to finally calling out to Hashem to release us and to bring redemption, I don't know about you, but I often pray for redemption to come. It would be nice to see wholeness back in our families and our life. Mm -hmm. It'd be wonderful to see people that we love dearly have all doubt removed, right? Wouldn't it be nice? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be just amazing to see your spouses and children that think you've just completely lost your mind all of a sudden go, you're right all along. <laughs> God is so amazing. God is so good, right? And so you, you, we, but when we see that, you realize why they're not able to break beyond that. What was Israel's, uh, what was seeded or rooted in Israel's doubt, self-doubt? It was the difficulties of enslavement. It was being bound by a system that, that they couldn't even fathom in their, in their wildest imaginations or dreams that Pharaoh would actually let them go. The power would actually do anything more than to enslave them. I mean, think about how dark is it in your life that you can't even fathom being let out. I can't imagine what it would be like to be in a prison, being abused, being enslaved, whatever analogy you want to use, and it be so dark that I have lost my hope. Because where Israel is at at this point, they have lost all hope. And you have Aaron and Moshe who are trying to tell him, it's going to be okay. We're going to get you out of here. Hashem's going to show you his arm. He's going to show you his hand. And we see all these anthropomorphic ideas come from our reading of the Torah where God says he turns his face to him and he hears them and, and they cry to him and he's going to show his mighty arm, his mighty hand. They're like, that's the low. Think about how low would you have to be to where the best news that you could ever get would not even, that's pretty low. The reason why Israel needed to see the Yud Chei Vav Hei of Hashem, the reason why they needed to see this self-sufficient one, this one who has all power to do everything that needed, who was able to pull down and manipulate the very elements itself, the reason why they needed to see that is because anything more, anything less than that, would have just not been sufficient. They wouldn't have believed. You know, Rod, I honestly think that the plagues that were put upon Egypt weren't for Egypt. They were more for Israel, so Israel can see. Precisely. It is going to happen. Precisely. And with each miracle, they grew uh, uh, more and more to believe. Precisely. Absolutely. What, why the attacks and the plagues? We, we kind of hit on this last week a little bit. We all understand that the attacks or the plagues that came, the, the, the um, what do you call it, the plagues that came were attacks against the deities of, of Israel, Egypt. What better way for you to know that deliverance is coming, that redemption is coming, than you begin to see the powers that be begin to crumble, right? The things that held you within your captivity. For many of you, this past year has been an amazing year of struggle and personal discovery. And once you begin to see how Hashem wars against the deities of our lives around us, not necessarily your deities, but the deities around you, the things that cause you to be focused off of the things of Hashem. We mentioned last week, what is the greatest deity in America today? Money, right? Money is the greatest deity. If Hashem's going to get Americans' attention, how is He going to do it? Take away the money. Take away, the money. <laughs> Take away their materialism. People that have no sense of materialism, that don't really care, they'd be happy living in the back of their SUV as they would be in the mansion. It doesn't matter because they are rooted in, in the sufficiency of Hashem. Think about it for a second. Yes, it would be uncomfortable, but most of us in this room are so happy just being able to study, so happy being able to have a relationship with Hashem. Ah, I would prefer not to eat potatoes for a whole year, but...
but I, I am rooted in Hashem because I know redemption's coming. But Israel is in such a dark place, they couldn't see that. So right now, if you were to able to have a, a you know, national form that you could stand and declare that redemption is coming soon to the nations and Hashem is going to redeem all the nations, He's going to, he's going to redeem everyone, and he's going, to, he's going to send His Mashiach, and amazing things are going to transform. They'll all look at you like, whatever. Right? Right. So we see the necessity, and we understand now what he means when he says that your fathers did not see me as, uh, as, as yud chay vav chay. Um, He says, Yea, the Israelites complaining was heard before me. Here's one of these very kind ways. Who has another translation? Anybody have a separate translation? What verse? In verse uh, 5. I've heard the groan of the children of Israel. Right. Uh, anybody else have anything different? Uh, he says, I've heard the groans or the pains that... Uh, they are holding them in bondage. My covenant was remembered. Therefore, saying to the Israelites, I am the Lord. I will deliver you from the oppressive Egyptian work. I will deliver you from their work. I will redeem you with an uplifting arm and, and great judgment. I will bring you near before me as a people. I will give you, I will be your God, and you shall know that I am your Lord who brought you out from an oppressive Egyptian work, I will bring you to the Lamb in which I affirmed with my word. Here are the great sayings of redemption here, right? What are the, what are the main aspects of, this, of, of redemption? How is redemption described here? Let's look at these words. Seven. Um, First, well, actually starts in verse 6. Uh, I will redeem you with a what? Uplifted arm. This is anthropomorphic mm -hmm. term. An uplifted arm. What is an uplifted arm? What? Is anybody? Outstretched. outstretched arm, right? Mm -hmm. So I am going to reach out to you. You're not capable of reaching out to me. Right. I'm going to reach out for you. And he says, therefore, to the Israelites, <clears throat> I am the Lord. I will deliver you from oppressive Egyptian. Uh, so we have uh, an outstretched arm. Uh, we have um, bring you near, right? And I will bring you to me. Right? So I will reach out. I will bring you in. I will be your God. You shall know that I am your Lord. I am your God who brought you out of an impressive. So this now bring you in and brought you out. So you will notice two things in the action. You, well, actually, you'll notice all, but you'll notice two very distinctive things that apply directly to the people. This is what they'll know. That God drew them near, but he also drew them out. It's one thing to be drawn near, but stay where you're at. But he's going to, they're going to experience him drawing them near and bringing them out of Egypt, right? So the next word we're going to look for is brought you out. I will bring you to the land which I affirmed. What other word do you guys have? Anybody have a different word? I raised my hand. Okay. Raised my hand. Right. So what is it? So who's who's affirming whom? Who's making an oath? It says, uh, uh, Angelo says, the biblical, I raised my hand, a metaphor for taking an oath. Oh. He is replaced with a less anthropomorphic phrase suggesting that God affirmed his covenant with his patriarchs rather than swear concerning the promised land with his word. Um, this idea of heritage that comes in, he says in verse um, eight. verse 8, eight. Mm -hmm. yes, uh, I will give you as a heritage, I am the Lord. The concept, Onkelos, does not distinguish between the Hebrew word Moroshah uh, used here, translated as heritage, and the word Yeshura, which means inheritance, both steaming from the same Hebrew word. Also, Deuteronomy 33, 4, in reference to the Torah. Yet, and in, in, yet linguistically, heritage belongs to a people even if they do not physically possess it. And inheritance, on the other hand, must be acquired. The obligation of Torah, which 
uh, which are the heritage are binding upon the Jews, even if they reject them. Similarly, the Holy Land, also a heritage, belongs to the Jews, Jew, even if it does not occupy it. So what is, what does he affirm? He affirms the covenant he made with exactly. Abraham. So later on, we're going to see what, what Hashem says to Moshe. He says, I'm not doing this because of you. You didn't merit that much. I'm doing this because of a covenant I made with Abraham. Mm -hmm. So was this covenant a covenant that the Israelites could break? No. no. Why can't they? Why couldn't they? Because they didn't raise their hand. Yeah. They weren't part of it. Exactly. They didn't stand and I solemnly mm -hmm. affirm. Right? Mm -hmm. They didn't do that. Now, what did they accept? They did accept something as part of the deal. They accepted Torah. Right? They did accept Torah. But the Torah was the mechanism that was going to allow them to fully possess the inheritance that Hashem had promised Avraham. What was the inheritance? The land. Make sense? So what they were what they needed was the mechanism to hold on to the land. Here, here is uh, the best way to, uh, uh, to best analogy. You have a very wealthy aunt dies, and you're called to the attorney's office, and you have, you know, old drunk Uncle Larry, and you know, uh, the womanizing uh, second cousin Mordecai. <laughs> You're thinking, I hope that this thing comes out all right. And it comes down, you find out that you actually are going to inherit this great piece of property. But along with the inheritance of that property, there are things that you have to do. Right? Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're below 20, your great aunt says, I want it only released to them when they're 27 years old or 30 and they finish college. And it's built in as a trust to help pay for some of the bills for college. But here are the things that they have to do to receive that. Was that inheritance or is that inheritance still theirs? Yes. Even yes. though they don't have it in their hands? Correct. Yes. And, but they had an obligation to fulfill their commitment and request that was made to them. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they had to adhere to the laws to receive their inheritance. Right? right? To receive the full inheritance. The inheritance are, is theirs. Now, this is the great coup d'etat Hashem has against Hasatan, right? Is that in spite of the Jewish people, whether they achieve it, they don't achieve it, in the end, they inherit it. That, I mean, right. it's a mind blowing. But in the meantime, they're learning by following Torah. The very best they can, and they right? Appreciate yes. it more right. and more each and every time. Right, and I would even take it one step further, even for those who are not at observant levels. Right. Even those who are not at observant levels, they're going to receive their inheritance. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. Sooner or later, redemption will come, and that's see, okay. that's the whole point of redemption. The whole point of redemption is to rectify the things that are so messed up in the world. Listen, we can all sit here and say, I, you know, let's merit Mashiach, let's do everything, do mitzvah, you know, let's do all these things. But the bottom line is this, I didn't start the mess. Did you? I didn't start the problems. I added to it. I added to it, <laughs> believe me. This is true. <laughs> I did my part, but I didn't start it. At the same time, it's not, the redemption is not going to rise or fall the outstretched hand of Hashem is not going to be extended or, or retrieved because I have failed to do something right. or that I've done something miraculous. That's right. Because Hashem is going to do what Hashem is going to do. Yeah. Why? Because He promised He would do it. Exactly. Now, so what? What? How, what is the great secret in the 21st century to be a part of the great redemption? Is, and this is why this community is so important, we understand that Israel and Judah have an inheritance in the land mm -hmm. and they are promised redemption. They have suffered as a people for the nations. We know that. Right. It's very clear. Isaiah 53. 
They've suffered for the cause of the nations. One day the nations will wake up and realize they've done that. But, but you, on the other hand, have recognized that already. And has also recognized that just as there was an Avraham, there was a Shem. Shem was not an Israelite was Shem. What was Shem? Gare. Gare. Noah Hyde. He was descendant right. of Noah. Mm -hmm. Right? But it took both Avraham and Shem to bring about divine spark in the world. The knowledge of Torah and the faith of Hashem. Did you see the two differences? Who was bringing Torah to the nations? Shem. Who was bringing divine essence to the world? Abraham. Both are needed. And if you can only realize that you play a part of the great day in which divine essence is drawn down by the Jewish people and a love for spreading the the great news of Torah to the nations comes because of the life of those who have not been called Jews, who have accepted the yoke of heaven and accepted the great knowledge of Hashem in their life. This, my friend, is the redemption that we have been talking about. Next, let's go on. Verse 9. Yes, ma'am. One phrase that's been left out over and over and this discourse is that he, I shall redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgment. Mm -hmm. And I was just looking at judgment sentence. Uh, yeah, he's going to uh, set things right. He's going to, to denote what is right and what is wrong. Right. The outstretched arm is and judgment is not against Israel, but it's against right. Egypt. Right. Mm -hmm. But that's important too. Absolutely. Being redeemed. Absolutely. Uh, and. and um, brought in, you're also being set in a place, and you're being uh, the. Um, it's being clarified that you are this, right. and you're not that, or you are not that. Right, and, not that. And, and we all we all realize uh, in this room, I would think, and I think that those people that be watching the the lesson today uh, realize that this has uh, meaning on a very personal level, and we've all kind of seen this in our own mm -hmm. life. We we have recognized when great redemption came to your life and the knowledge of Torah, you, you saw how God began to do some amazing things in your life. So this redemption always follows this sort of same plan. And you realize when, when it's all over, when you find yourself sort of in that sweet spot of relationship with Hashem, you realize that yes, you pursued, you know, by faith, by Yomuna, to have a relationship with God, but He did it all. He did an amazing work. Right, I mean, listen, think about it. How many, how many of us realize, let's put it this way, nobody in this room would say, I, the reason why I'm here is because, frankly, I'm so intelligent. And I just understand all of my knowledge of Torah has come because, well, I had this great ability to, to analyze text and know. And we all know that that is, uh, that's malarkey. malarkey. Because we realized when we first started studying, what happened to most of us, like our brain exploded, I could see a little spark go out, smoke come out of our ears, right? And then all of a sudden, one day, Hashem sees your earnestness and begins to open up divine spark to you. Uh, Loretta and I were talking before about prophecy that, that, that will acknowledge uh, divine treasure that God will give to the Jewish people in the end of age. It will actually also be spread out to, to everywhere. The nations will also have it. And so by the time Mashiach comes, this divine knowledge will be at such a high level that just without doubt people will know. Right? In the meantime, what do we have? We have just little essences, little mm -hmm. sparks. Mm -hmm. And, you know, think about it. It's just the little spark that blows the top of your head off. Mm -hmm. Right? Can you imagine what it's going to be like to have... <clears throat> the giant plug-in to the mainframe. Can you imagine what it's like when you go off of dial-up with Hashem and plug in the, what, what? give me the highest level, is it T1? No, that's not T1. Cable, internet, I don't know. You're the IT guy, but fiber. yeah, wh whatever you, when you plug into the highest level fi fiber, there you go, it's fiber. fiber plug in the fiber optic and all of a sudden it says, it's amazing. It's amazing what we'll see. 
but wouldn't it be right. neat? But maybe these people have been told that they probably uh, weren't as good as the Egyptians. The Egyptians were making them really uh, feel very small, very worthless. Right. Um, and then God comes in with his judgments and he says, right. no, you're this. Right. And that is huge. I, mean, I think that that's the only huge. thing that we have to, 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 to rely on. Um, I was chatting with someone uh, the other night and he had said that um, being raised uh, most of his life with a idea that he bore no responsibility for his actions, actions and spiritual life. It was all, you know, somebody else's responsibility. Mm -hmm. Now, the walk of faith is uh, such a, a powerful one that you have to put a hundred percent reliance on the show. Hundred percent. I mean, you can't rely on him. You can't even rely on your own actions because you realize your own actions can disappoint him. You know, uh, disappoint yourself. You would fall short. Mm -hmm. So the idea is we fall on the great mercy of Hashem. And I had said to him, because the word uh, the word justice came up. That, you know, we know that Hashem is a just God. And I said, yes, but my prayers every night is not that Hashem would deal with me with justice. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mercy. Mercy. With mercy. Yeah. You understand the difference? Yeah. It's like, I know he's just. I don't need any of that. I need his mercy. I need him to smile on me when in reality, judgment should become, but what should come? But what are we looking here? God loves his people. He loves his creation. He wants to bring judgment, but not to His people, not to His creation. He wants to bring judgment for the evil in the world that wants to enslave His people to keep them from serving Him. So every time that you're reminded that you, because of your work schedule, because of your life, whatever it may be, that you're not quite able to just, just ratchet it up one more notch, cry out to Hashem. Cry out to Hashem. Cry out. I need redemption. I need, I need you. I can't do this. And if you don't show me your outstretched arm, if you don't bring judgment in the world, there's injustice in the world at the highest level. It, it's not a fair place to live right now. Mm -hmm. And I can't serve you like I want to serve you. And we can't see it very clearly. No, we can't see it. No, we can't. You're, you're so busy, so buried in making bricks with not without straw. Well, isn't that why so they busy, have, so busy, right? Isn't that why they have the afternoon prayer? Is that that's when you take the time out of your schedule? Correct. Out of the world? Right. And you ask for a redemption for all mankind? Correct. Not just the Jews don't I, just say it for themselves. Ab absolutely. It's absolutely. all mankind. So the, the secret is for us to not lose heart. And to keep um, to keep the idea of redemption so close to our bosom mm -hmm. that we remind ourselves. And and I, I, I'm saying this to you, while at the same time I'm one of those people that often feels the pain of discouragement, right? Because you realize how much more you would love to be able to accomplish in mitzvah. Right? What more would you love to be able to do? And realize you're sort of enslaved to this system. Right? We were talking uh, the, the, over the week, I was watching the news, and they talked about how much each American will put on their credit card just for uh, the holiday season. Right? And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, that's that's the mortar. I mean, that's the bricks with no straw. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you're already in debt. Americans are in debt to like exactly. ridiculous levels. Mm -hmm. And what do they do? They come across this this faux religious holiday, and they begin putting more debt. And it's like the gods of this world want to enslave <coughs> people, good people, good people. Yes, Miss Betty. One, um, one phrase that I read in a commentary years ago regarding all of this redemption was 
uh, Hashem says, I brought you out to bring you in. Oh, man, that's good. Yeah. And to me, that's key. That's, that's wherever we are, he can bring us out over and over and over to bring us in to himself and into the place where we need to be. Right. I think, let's think about this for just a moment. What does it mean to go out of something and go into another? It means complete change of position, uh, complete relocation. And so if we're to understand what uh, tshuva is, repentance, that is repentance. It's removing yourself from one place and entering into another place. But what's so beautiful about this is he is the one who will bring you to that place. So what we can't, what we've got to do is guard our, our soul, our neshama, our spirit, guard ourselves. So as we are attempting to do everything we can to come out of this, Ultimately, we're not going to come out until Hashem brings us out. And we're not going to go fully in until Hashem puts us in. So what is our duty today? Keep going. Keep going. What was the duty of the Israelites at the time? To keep making bricks. Right? Keep doing the best you can. Keep resisting the man as much as you can, at the same time realizing, I'm stuck here. I am stuck here. And so what do we all have to do in this day, in the 21st century? Yes, we all have jobs. Yes, we all have impossibilities. Many of us are sort of divided between uh, two peoples, our own families and maybe friends and associates don't understand you, and yet you are having a hard time feeling like you fit into a particular uh, genre or group of people within uh, Judaism, I would say to you, don't fret. Don't fret. Just keep doing what you know you should do. Do the very best you can because redemption's coming. Redemption's coming. This clu- concludes the lesson for today. So let's all let everyone know. Shalom. Shalom. Any questions, fears, doubts, or